The Celestial Earth. This is a painting of the night sky imagined as a celestial world. Typically, the constellations are thought of as being placed upon the celestial dome as stickers are placed on a globe, random images with little to no sense of relationship between one constellation and another. This painting proposes a new way to look at the stars. It's an imagined topography, a map of land, air, and sea upon which the constellations sit, inhabiting a world of imagination. Figures populate the scene in dramatic relationship to one another and to the world around them. Seasons change in the celestial world just as they do in our waking world. The celestial menagerie reacts to these changes in the same way as we do. Through this reimagining of the stars, we can perceive a whole new world of relationships and meaning in our familiar company of constellations. The piece represents the celestial earth, or the world within the skies. The celestial earth is made up of three primal elements, air, water, and fire. The air is the portion of the image above, and the waters are the portion below. The fire is the light which illuminates the world when it sits above the waters, and which lies hidden in darkness when it dips below. The Milky Way sits like a whirlpool at the bottom of the celestial dome in the dark portion of the year. Its revolution is the cause of the mixture and permutation of the cosmos. From this commingling of elements comes forth the fourth element, Earth, rising from the celestial waters and touching the heavenly air. Upon the celestial waters sits a small island of Earth, whereupon a doorway is opened to the center of the cosmos. This is the altar upon which Zeus laid the first sacrifice before his war with the Titans. Fire is the catalyst of change, transforming water into air and back again throughout the year. Upon the celestial stage, the great fire of heaven traces its annual course. The sun's pathway through the skies marks the familiar change of the seasons. As the warm heavenly fire rises from the cold earth, kissing the air at the dawn of spring, the earth gives forth clear, fresh waters which bubble up from the earth, bringing fructifying life to the celestial world. Green grass springs from moist soil, and the warmth of fire and air cause the fresh waters to evaporate, forming clouds in the upper air. These clouds build and congeal until they're full and send the waters back down to the earth as rain. As spring gives way to summer, the warm fire reaches its celestial peak and the earth becomes parched. Soil becomes thirsty and dry. The waters poured from heaven can no longer penetrate the arid ground, and instead the earth erodes at the touch of the lustral waters. Mineral deposits cascade from the earth, and leaving the shore they enrich the sea. The waters are no longer amiable to the life of man, but feed instead a new life, a darker subterranean life born beneath the salted sea. In summer, the warm celestial fire turns back towards the earth and begins to descend towards its cool surface. As it pierces the moist air, the celestial clouds are stirred up, warm winds whip through the skies, and the seas become deadly dangerous. As the airy warmth crosses the threshold of the waters, the heavenly fire is planted within the earth. Embedded in its bosom, the heaven's fire is cooled. The season of autumn has arrived. As sun and Milky Way collide, the storms in the heavens become ravenous, raging over the tumultuous seas. All is cold in this season, life is spent, and the light of heaven has all but gone out. The moisture within the earth is withered as it is quenched by the flame of heaven, which sends a dry, airy exhalation from earth to sky. This exhalation is born from the fire and earth, for the celestial fire separates the earth from its last vestiges of lustral water. Freed from the terrestrial abode, these waters are sent as incense towards the stars. As winter comes, the celestial fire again turns northward. As it rises from the earth, life is again kindled in its bowels. As the fire ascends, the cold moisture which had been locked in the heavens descends. The pure heavenly waters again fall to earth, mingling with the salted sea, diluting and calming its harsh waves. The ground is again softened, the air is again calm, the seas are likewise still, and the light of heaven returns to its celestial abode as the year is renewed. Spring is a time of new life and rejuvenation, when the celestial warmth of the sun is at its most beneficent. Freed from the celestial waters and not yet at its equinoctial peak, it pours life-giving rays upon the earth. 
The fruit of the vine, plucked in the prior seasons, now fermented and aged, has become the sweet wine. It is ready to be consumed, and life is all joy and leisure. The god welcomes this joyous season. Beside the divine maiden and surrounded by the beasts of the field and the lush greenery of the welcoming earth, he beckons us to take our fill of the fruits of the year. But this pleasantness belies a darker mystery. For the queen of the gods loathes mankind and wishes no joy for this earth. She sends ill omens after the god. Behind the god, and driven by her son's chariot, the poisonous spray of the queen of the gods' breast pours forth from the apex of heaven, encircling the world in a foreboding mist which cascades down towards the earth. The corrupting influence of the queen of the gods' milk touches all at the start of this season. Brother is pitted against brother, blood is spilled upon the earth and pours freely into the salted sea. This is the nectar of the monstrous titans, pooling in the pit of the earth. Beneath the god, this milk turns turpid, stagnating in the depths of the celestial waters. Here is summer and the birthplace of iniquity. The crow of Apollo, seeking pure water, drinks of this poisonous nectar and is stung by the bitter draught, his feathers blackening as he laps up the wretched bile. Overcome by this strong drink, the god and maiden now sit in decadence at the summit of the earth, a mighty lion and his bride. Too high they sit, their hubris sends forth a ravaging fire which scorches the earth. Following on the heels of the hunter's dogs, the god senses the dangers of the season. With the maiden he flees this sweltering heat. They seek the ship, the Argo, to set sail for safer shores. But they are not long preparing when they are beset by the dread hydra of Herculean fame, a wretched spawn risen from the putrid swamp made of mother's milk. The boat is capsized and the god is dragged down by the dread titan. The maiden is lost to the sea, broken. The body of the god falls upon the shores of the lower world. Far off in the distance, Astraea, the goddess of justice, looks on as the monstrous beast capsizes the god's boat. In disgust, she turns from this world and passes to the far distant shores beyond broad ocean at the western limit of the world. She moves to ascend the rocky stairway that leads to Olympus. A single light beckons her, shimmering from the mountain's rocky summit. There stands the god's messenger, shining forth a promise of justice's eventual return. It is autumn, and the god lies dead. But wise Chiron has witnessed his fate and prepares a sacrifice. Carrying forth the god's body, he brings it to the gaping mouth of Zeus's primal altar. He works his craft upon the dead and quickens the ravaged body of the god which rises before the tumultuous sea. With justice gone, however, the titans reign and a mighty serpent rears its terrifying head from the depths of the celestial waters, spewing its fiery venom at the god. From the earth arises a dread scorpion, its poisonous tail stabbing with a cold, paralyzing lunge. But again, on the brink of death, the god is saved from destruction. Zeus's fire, the breath of life, strikes from heaven, liberating soul from flesh. The body falls beneath the earth, and the god's spirit is sent forth as a mighty eagle, which rises with the smoke of sacrifice. Unable to ascend, however, the god's soul is chained to the side of Mount Orthus, caught by the lingering seed of titanic power within its breast. Shackled like the body of mighty Prometheus, Zeus's eagle rends the flesh from his soul, tearing away the remnants of his corruptible body. Healed now, an arrow shot from below arouses the eagle and sets the soul of the god free of this torment. The god's ship bursts forth from the celestial waters, led by the noble dolphin. It is carried to the far shores, to the base of Mount Olympus. The god is reborn as the swan spirit Orpheus, singing his mystic song as he descends from heaven, dispelling the ominous drone that gurgles in the titan's throats. It is winter now, and the ruddy god Pan plays his pipes from the depths of the earth, calling down the god's soul to unite with its noble body. Assailed from both sides, the titans are overcome. Deprived of their earthly prize, however, the titans make one final, desperate grasp for the heavens. The maiden, surviving the perils of the sea, is exposed upon the rocks. The aged serpent strikes at her, seeking to claim one final victim as prize. But the hero, 
rising on the back of Pegasus, strikes hard at the beast's throat, arresting its approach and sending its corpse hurtling towards the sea below. The blood of the titan falls to the waters, and from it is born the fair-haired Aphrodite, the lady of Cyprus, born to shore by the twin sons of the old man of the sea. As its corpse strikes the water, the death of the titan sends forth sea to sky, and the oceans are purged of their taint. With the titans defeated and her army laid to waste, the queen of the gods' rage no longer reigns. Purified and returned to their celestial home, she welcomes back the souls of righteousness and wicked to her bosom. With the seas made pure and the god born within her breast, Gaia is made rich by the marriage of warmth and moisture. The very air is full of the breath of life. The maiden reaches forth her hand, which is taken up by the hero who carries her across the threshold into the dawning spring. Thank you.